Hi, I'm Molly. And I'm Jamie, and this is our From the Pasture with Hired Hand podcast. As the owners of Hired Hand website software, we've been developing websites and creating internet marketing strategies for livestock breeders for the past 10 years. The majority of our customers are involved in the breeding of registered animals, such as Texas Longhorns, Highland Cattle, Horses, and White-tailed Deer, where the pedigrees are very important. The From the Pasture with Hired Hand podcast examines many of the differences in raising pedigreed livestock for maximum profit. Join us and learn what we're covering today. Today I'm online with Crown Creek Cattle, Ryan and Lacey Tewksbury. Uh, How are you both today? Great. Good. Good. So today we are going to talk about hunting, race cars, and longhorns. Is that right? Yes. A lot of the things we do. Well, I was reading on your website a little bit preparing for today and what stood out at me the most, I kind of had a, I think my jaw probably hit the ground is in 2023, you purchased over a hundred head of longhorns. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether that's awesome or crazy, but that is <laughs> correct. Well, let's hear a little bit more about that. What, what prompted you to do that? Who helped you get started? Walk me through your, your origin story here. Lacey got us started, so go ahead. So it actually, I grew up, my papa did have cows when I was younger growing up, but I really wanted longhorns. So I just actually wanted a few. Um, but if you never met my husband, anytime we do anything, it always goes from zero to a, I would say 200% anything. So I bought four and he always does his research. So it went from four to over a hundred. Yeah. He, she got the, the four. She told me I needed, we bought a brand new piece of property in paradise and we were building a house. So I had to hurry up and get a fence for these four longhorns that she went and got. And then when they got here, I thought, Oh, they're neat, but it wasn't that really impressed because they weren't of the highest quality compared to the standards. We had no idea what we were talking about. So we got an Eddie Woods, classic catalog in the mail and i i just wanted to get a bull i couldn't understand why there weren't any bulls in the sale but there was one particular cow 20 gauge special that was in the sale that we wanted to look at getting so we hauled butt down there on the day of the auction wound up buying three and we're just blown away about these animals and then uh it was an instant addiction to me to going on uh, like Hubble's website and a bunch of other websites and trying to figure out where to get bulls and absolutely buying almost everything wrong uh, (laughs) now, uh, but going after it a little bit too crazy. The auctions, I'm a big fan of auctions, the excitement. So we'd go to an auction and come home with 15 animals and I'd look at her and go, what the heck am I doing? Are we just going to (laughs) stop? Well, we're going to circle back to your two comments about bulls here in a couple of minutes, because I feel like that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, when I looked at your website and kind of saw your, your motto about bulls that differs from a lot of folks, but what was the biggest difference that you saw from the first few that you purchased Lacey to when you went in person to that Eddie Wood sale or, or looked at that sale catalog, what kind of changed in your mind there? I believe what changed is. I didn't really understand the genetics back then, um, how the breeder that I bought the first four from, how he was doing his breeding program, um, looking at those versus how the breeders today were doing their breeding and how important it was um, going back and looking at them and, um, and the genetics going back to the original um in the very beginning genetics of longhorns, um, butler breeding and all of those, and just learning what we're learning today and, and still learning. We are still so, there's still so much knowledge to gain, um, but it's just. Um, she just wanted longhorns. I did. With no, just registered longhorns. Didn't have any clue, anything other than that, which is by, by all means, not her to her fault. No. How would anybody know unless they just got lucky and went to a sale and saw, you know, the quality that's out there. So like our biggest longhorn was 55 inches of the four we got and it was four years old. So to give you an idea, 
of what we were first dealing with. And we still have some of them that we're just use as recips now. That was going to be my next question is it seems with a lot of folks that those first few buy, whether what, whether how much your program changes after them, mm-hmm. they have kind of a forever home because you're emotionally tied to them, if anything. So is, that's the case. You're using them as recips then? Well, to some degree, we have one we really like. The other ones is just because, and I don't mean this in any disrespect to the animal, but they're so crappy, <laughs> pardon my French, that I don't know why anybody would ever want to buy it. So... Uh, and, and we have a hard time taking them to the sale barn knowing their fate. Uh, so they work as a recip and we've got all these incredible embryos now. So it just works. Does that make kind of sense? Oh yeah, completely. So those first few, Lacey, did you have like a, a hide color that you liked or like a horn set that you liked? Or did you truly just go out and just, you know, yep, these four are good. We'll take them home. I really like temperament. Um, if they came up to me, I did like color. Color was a big deal to me, but it was mainly color and temperament. And that was probably our fault at the beginning. If a cow would come and take a treat, we'd buy it. <laughs> didn't matter what its heritage is, didn't matter anything. And then if we liked <laughs> the color, like you said, and, and something about the ant or the horns, then we'd buy it. And then, then we met Hark, Mark Hubble, and he just shook his head and laughed at us and said, man, you've done pretty much every single thing wrong. So let's rebuild this. So I noticed you do have um, a couple Hubble bred or, you know, some Hubble breeding in your program. So I assume that Mark's still a good, a good friend and a good resource kind of helping you direct the path of your program. Yeah, I probably talk to Mark 35 times a day. He's become <laughs> quite possibly my best friend. Um, he's an amazingly wonderful guy. Uh, we really bonded well. So when they, every time they come for auctions now, they stay with us. And we, we, he means the world to us. So, That's yeah, awesome. and I, we, we like his cows. So going back to Mark Hubble, the very first interaction with him was Eddie Wood Classic. We bought Melba. And she was our, one of our very first, I mean, good cows, great cows that we ever bought. And it was the very first auction and I had paperwork on her and I just had a question. And so he was, she was consigned to the auction from him. And so I just called him up just out of the blue. Cause he's in Michigan. And I just said, Mr. Hubble, I just had some questions. Would you answer them? He was incredibly nice to answer every single question I had. Um, and he said, anytime you have any questions, just please call me. And so I told Ryan about him. They got connected. And ever since then, he's become a great friend. Yeah, I think we've bought maybe 40 animals from him. (laughs) So he kind of has a a south herd he can come visit then, right? (laughs) Yeah, right. We went up to Michigan. I brought 20 Gauge and Roman 7 and Heartbreaker. I, I drove them up there last August to him so I could see his place. And and then I came back with 15 animals. You know, another 15. So, uh, you know, when we're talking to people other than the genetic side, which obviously is the important part if you're trying to make money, it's what you like to look at. So, like I said earlier, that's kind of a fault of ours because there's not a lot of money in a lot of the things that you just like to look at if they don't have that pedigree that people are looking for. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've picked the things that we enjoy looking at. Who are some other folks that have helped you in the, in this first year or two? Uh, Justin Sabio, uh, EJS Ranch. So he and his family actually live maybe two miles down the road. So they're here at least weekly, or I'm at his place helping each other out. Uh, I got back the day before yesterday. I drove with him down to a new age cattle company to take a bull and was absolutely blown away by the knowledge Randy and intelligence Murray. of Randy Murray. I mean, I'm still trying to process all the information <laughs> that he gave me. Uh, so we've met several, several great people. The Buxtons have been wonderful to deal with. And, you know, they're just one year further into us than us. So mm-hmm. that was kind of neat. They had the exact same start, but one year earlier, also at the Eddie Woods. Uh, and we've met some other people that 
you know, have been uh, knowledgeable, but the people that have been the closest and the most willing to help uh, are those that we just listed off. So previously you mentioned embryos and then just now you mentioned Justin Sabio. Am I, is it good to assume he's helped you with some of the AI work and some of those sorts of things? Yeah. So he does all of our AI and embryo implant work for our Longhorns. We also have a fairly big Wagyu operation that we started at the exact same time. And he is now, he kind of came with an embryologist and he's now getting into that for us as well. So he's a huge part of our entire cattle program. Well, I feel like that's maybe a leg up you have on some some fellow newer breeders because I feel like that AI um, piece sometimes takes a while for folks to figure out, right? So if you can start off with a high success rate right from the go, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the embryos that you have in the works right now. If, if we can know about them, I know some folks are like shush shush about them. So yeah, we're not to that point yet, obviously. But so again, not knowing really a lot about this stuff last year, I, I contacted Mark. I'm a big fan of Roman seven, the bull Roman seven. And our best bull is a Roman seven son. So I figured he probably had a lot of embryos. So I made a deal with him that uh, if he sent down a bunch of embryos, we would put them in our cows, the ones that we talked about, and we would raise them to six months. And after six months, he would get half and, and we would get half of the embryo. So we have multiple 20 gauge and Roman seven embryos from him uh, that some of them were born last week. We have a couple more being born in the next few weeks. Uh, I think we implanted seven and we have unfortunately only three that looks like no four that are going to actually throw. Um, and then we've recently flushed our two better cows, which is 007 Ketcha and Miss Melba, uh, also to Roman seven and EGS 50. And we have a hundred and some of those embryos, way more than I wanted, <laughs> but it's, it's the way it works. So we're going to start trying to sell those or see if people would like to, to buy those embryos just because it's too many. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not big into it as a lot of these guys are. Uh, we're just lucky enough to have Justin down the road to help make sure that we do well. For sure. I imagine that's very helpful. How are some of the ones on the ground looking, the ones that you're going to split with Mark? Well, so far we only have two. Okay. One came out. <laughs> I mean, it looks exactly like this, <laughs> which is oh, man. shocking. All for those of, of for those of you that are listening and not watching, he just held up a a bright white sheet of paper. So <laughs> they got their first white calf. It sounds like it has the slightest bit of light tan on the tips of its ears, and that's it. So that's going to be interesting. And it's a bull. And then we had another one that's a bull. So. For some reason, we like, we like bulls, like you talked about, and it's good because we, last year we had 26 calves and we only had three heifers. So we are a bull producing piece of property over here. I don't know if it's what's in the grass or what, but. <laughs> well, let's, let's, just, let's just get into the bull addiction then. So a lot of folks, you know, go the opposite way. They're like, I'm going to use you know, I'm going to use semen or I'm going to, you know, lease a bull and split it. But I think I, uh, now I'm going to have to go back and look at your site. Was there, is there like almost 20 bulls on your site that are at well, your we place? We almost 30 and we sold <laughs> six or seven of them in the last couple of weeks. A, a lot of them being calves, but I, I don't know. So as you can see behind us, hunting is a big part of our lives, always has been. Mm -hmm. And I've been a hunting guide for 25 years and in, let's say white-tailed deer, which is the most popular species to hunt, at least in the U.S., people look for three things, width, mass, and height. And of those three, usually everybody has one thing they prefer. Me is mass. I like the thickness of the antler. So we're, we're the opposite of most longhorn people, too. In longhorns, they call it base. We think base is awesome. And it seems like the bulls have the most base and it's accepted more than the cows having it. Plus they just seem to be for the most part, much more relaxed other than when they get at each other. Uh, 
and lazier and more my speed in that regard. So uh, we went to the legacy sale last year, which was the second auction we had ever gone to and lightning in the bottle was there. And he has, you know, these big massive vases. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I need a hundred of him. <laughs> so that, and Lacey's feels the same way. You know, she likes that docile, big, strong, you know, rugged look that a bull brings. So tell, tell the listeners a little bit about some of your favorite bulls. Maybe I should limit you to to your top five that are in your herd. <laughs> the first one. Go ahead. So our first one, our top favorite in, in our herd is Hubble's Roman Crown. Um, he won Horn Showcase. Horn, Horn Showcase last year. He's not even three yet. He's right at 90. Yeah. He's right at 90. He's beautiful. He's white and um, dark and brindle, real chill. He um, doesn't move fast. He's just goes at his own pace. Loads in the trailer all by himself. He's <laughs> yeah. a great, great just animal. Open, open the gate. And then we have Hubble's Contender, which yeah. has massive base, you know, stuff we like. Also about to be three. He's like 82 inches. He's a, a, a silent icon son, which silent icon is the son of Cowboy Tough Check and Silent Iron. So, you know, two massive animals. And we also have Silent Icon, his dad, uh, which I would think he'd be better than he is. He's only 78 inches wide. You have two parents over 100 inches. He might have got the short end of the stick, but the genetics are there, obviously. And then we have too many to list calves that are up and coming. Um, They have really good pedigrees. The funniest thing is the, the bull that we actually like the look of the most is named Boogeyman, which Mark hates the name because <laughs> we really love Grula. And in the winter, he gets about six and a half inches of curl in between his horns, which is hilarious. Uh, but again, he's only maybe 65 inches wide at three years old. So he's, he's a 20 gauge son. So he's got the, the pedigree as well. Just didn't get the horn. So the first, the first few bulls that you mentioned of breeding age, how are they, how are you planning for them to impact your program? We bred Roman, what we call Roman, Roman crown to 15 girls this winter. And then contender, we only bred to five thinner horned uh, heifers. Um, we're just kind of trying to see where that goes. Uh, we're we're now partnering with Mark and Dale Metz on 20 gauge. Um, so we'll get him next November for four or five months. And we'll probably breed most everything to him because he throws such you know, real flashy, colorful offspring. And we're trying to get more into the futurities with that. <laughs> So um, what was what was the name of the first bull you mentioned that had crown in his name? Royal Crown? The Hubble's Roman Crown. Roman Crown. That's what it yeah. was. Because so, his so, dad is Roman 7. Okay. My question was going to be, I didn't realize he had Hubble's at the beginning of his name. My question was going to be if he tied to your ranch name at all, the Crown Creek Cattle, and kind of how that came to be. But I assume Mark named him if that's, if it has his. Ooh, well, Mark's awesome. He'll. When you buy an animal from Mark, if it's within two years old or so, he'll let you name it. He just asked to have Hubble's in it, which is totally understandable. Um, so we just try to get crown somewhere and everything, which makes it for a, long, a lot of names. Uh, but we've got crown in almost everything that we've purchased that at a young age. And as the new ones come out, we're trying to start it with crown like most people do. So how did you come up with your ranch name, the Crown Creek Cattle? So we own multiple businesses and we always tie Crown into it. And then we have a creek that runs through our property. So I asked, you know, or threw the name out, Crown Creek Cattle. And it just kind of tied well and flowed. So did you come up with a new brand for the Longhorns or did you re, do you have something that also tied in with your other businesses for that? Well, we, she made a crown brand, but that, or designed one, 
same as all of our businesses logo, but they couldn't make one on one of those irons. So we just did like three C's with like a longhorn. And then recently uh, we found a Wagyu operation in North Carolina that does a coal brand. And we have now had one made of that crown symbol. So we're switching to the coal brand or freeze brand, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. uh, with our crown logo from, from this point forward. Nice. So, so everything will tie together full circle. Yeah, then. it'd be cool. <laughs> we're excited about it. Well, I know that you have a big family too. So tell me a little bit about how your kids are involved in the operation. We just have one daughter. Oh, we I'm have, sorry. That's okay. I'll, I'll mark that to edit. Yeah. We have a huge family. I mean, I have 52 cousins. Uh, Lacey has a bazillion of them as well. His mom uh, lives here. Right. My mom lives on the property with us. So we have, we have a big extended family, uh, but just, just one 17 year old daughter and that's plenty. <laughs> um, and every day that we're doing something, or if I'm working the pens, everybody comes down and help. My mom's probably been run over five times by Longhorns because she always seems to be in the wrong place, oh. <laughs> but she never stops wanting to be there. Uh, and we have some hands that help us that are amazing and we're real thankful for at both of our properties. So we're real lucky in that regards to have a lot of help. So what does your daughter think of having Longhorns? Was she excited with your first few and has she gotten involved at all? She likes the calves. Yeah. And then she homeschools. So one of her <laughs> classes or one of her electives is helping around here. Nice. <laughs> well, she's 17. She really couldn't care less for the most part about much of anything that we do, but she does help with everything. Correct. We're very lucky. Love what you're hearing? Be sure to check out our pickup truck confessions. It's a video series where we hop in the truck or a rental car and interview a variety of breeders about what drives their passion for their livestock, how they got started in the breed of their choice, marketing tips, and more. And now back to the podcast. So we've talked a lot about how you got started and who's involved and who's helped you. Let's talk a little bit about the future of your program. Where do you see it in the next year, the next five years? You know, I mean, that's a good question. I don't know. We're kind of like fly by the seat of our pants type people. We started off with 50 acres here in Paradise. And now we're up to over 500 between purchase and lease land because just keep gotten to having to feed these things. So uh, I, I don't know. My goal is to, to get a thousand acres in one that's all together, which is very difficult to do these days. And, and be able to have a more synchronized operation instead of multiple pastures. But, uh, we'll just see. I mean, we don't really have a goal. We didn't get involved in this in any way for the money side of it. If, if money were to come in, that's great. It's more just because we like looking at the animals and we enjoy it, although it's stressful at times. So we're lucky in that regards that we don't need to you know, make a profit each year or sell enough stuff to be able to keep it going. i uh, really obviously very fortunate and thankful that that's, that's how it is. So we don't really have like this ultimate plan of selling, growing so many and selling so many to sustain. I just don't want to get overrun because mm -hmm. last year's drought was painful for everybody. And we were part of that pain. Uh, and I don't want that to be a, happen again. You know, I'm sure a lot of people are saying the same thing. So the biggest thing is getting enough land to be able to be self-sufficient and feeding the animals without having to haul in a lot of food. Does a little part of you kind of hope or dream that maybe five years from now, we'll be looking at a, a really nice bull in the industry with the type of horns that you like and crown in his name that maybe came from your breeding? Yeah, it'd be cool. We have a lot of people already asking about Roman crown because again, he's, he's 34 months. He just hit 90 inches. So he'll probably be 92 or so at three years old. And for what I'm told and what I've studied, that's pretty incredible. So the 600 inch bulls on, on arrowhead, uh, all of them were right there, either a, an inch ahead of him, but most of them were, weren't even this big at his age. So there's a really good chance, especially the way it's run, that we'll, we might get to be one of the top 10 100-inch bulls. And that would be awesome. Yeah. 
we'd be very proud of that. Um, but if, but if it didn't happen, it's not the end of the world, but it would be neat for sure. It'd be neat. Well, we'll be, we'll be keeping track of it. Cheering you on. <laughs> yeah. The, um, you know, again, going back to Mark, he's really smart when it comes to marketing and telling people, and Tom Buxton's helped me as well. So we just started a marketing campaign. So I think the trails magazine should be coming out here any day and he's got a full page ad in it and he'll have an ad every month for the, for the next year with his new measurements. So people can follow along on his growth to see if he isn't one of the next hundred inches. Nice. Well, we'll be sure to look for that too then. Yeah, that'd be cool. So I have to admit that when we do these podcast interviews and there's a husband wife on together, I really like it because I just think it gets both different points of views and, you know, it's a shared passion. But I also always have to ask, do you have any stories from working cattle together or bidding against each other at sales or <laughs> anything like that? You can share with us. We haven't bid against each other at sales, thank goodness. Well, <laughs> Although my cousin I do and I have, have that a machinery sale, but. I do have that one. I do have one story. One time at an auction, we were there was a cow that came up, and I thought they were at thirty five hundred dollars. Oh yeah, it was a legacy, not this year, the year before. And so I bid. They were actually at thirty five thousand. <laughs> and I'm yeah. and I'm going to her. Hey, you know we're still very new. It's our second auction. I still don't <laughs> understand why these things are going for so much money. It doesn't make sense to me yet. So we made a deal that we wouldn't buy anything over 10,000, oh. which to me is still, <laughs> is still a lot of money. And uh, I knew that they were way up there and she just liked this black and white. Again, not knowing what we're doing, just going off a of color. There was a black and white. She wanted a black and white in the herd. So she's bidding on looking at her. His cousin looked at me. And she's not <laughs> looking back at me. She's very serious and focused. <laughs> My cousin was uh, with us because his wife was out of town. And, and him and I are looking at each other like, what is going on? And then finally, she couldn't get, uh, I forget what his name is, Jay. She couldn't get Jay's attention. So finally, she gets his attention and he takes the bid. And I went, no. <laughs> Stop. And they stopped the auction oh, no. for me to say, she thinks it's 3500 <laughs> And Jay starts laughing. And the guy that does the bidding starts laughing. It's like, okay, where were we? Where were we? Oh, I never sweat so bad. They I, took it back, thank God. But it was, yeah. That was humorous. So now that, we know. That, you, I'm glad you can laugh at that. I mean, I feel like it, I, I don't know if you'd be laughing at if, if the story had ended differently. Yeah, if they didn't oh. take it back, you would be yeah. yeah, well, we would have had an experience. That's I listen sure. very well now. I'm <laughs> sure they did. But, you know, like everything else, we were on a plane ride not too long ago, and there was a gal that had a T-shirt on that said, I'm sorry for what I said while we're working cattle. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that. I took a picture of her, asked her if it was okay, and sent it to Lacey. I was like, holy cow, I need this shirt. <laughs> because, you know, when everything's going wrong, which happens, unfortunately, often, and they just aren't cooperating, it's so easy to get so frustrated and then there's other days like yesterday, we had one cow at the complete opposite end of the pasture. <laughs> Justin Savio was over to palpate to see what things are going. And I was like, all right, let's get all of our four wheelers and motorcycles and flags and people. And we got to the other end of the field and she ran all the way to the crowds <laughs> and just put herself in a pen. It's like, that doesn't yeah. ever happen ever. So you just never know what you're going to get on any given day. So it makes it interesting. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you all can laugh about it. That's the important thing. Yeah. <laughs> We don't plan on stopping anytime soon. That's for sure. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the other things we were going to touch on your hunting operation and your race cars, which ones, which one of those do you want to talk about first? Uh, I mean, we could talk about the hunting. Okay. So I started guiding hunts in like 1998, been hunting my whole life. I grew up in Pennsylvania and Michigan, uh, which hunting is a huge part of those the populace that I was involved in, my grandfather, my father, uh, all my uncles. And it just became a, a big part of my life. And then uh, while I was in college, I worked at a hunting ranch called the Sanctuary in Michigan. And then when I graduated college, that's all I did is guided hunts for a few years throughout the country. And, uh, and when I didn't have a, a, you know, two nickels to rub together, I would trade 
hunt uh, some of my services to be able to hunt myself and started getting my collection of, of animals. And then when I met Lacey, uh, her and Brinley decided they wanted to do some hunting. So we went to Africa and, you know, several different countries and hunted all different things that I've always wanted to, but never really had a reason big enough to. And when Lacey was such a big supporter, she was like, well, let's try getting this and let's try getting that. We went to Africa. All my daughter wanted to get was a giraffe, which shocked me. <laughs> that was the one thing that she would never want to get. So we've had a lot of fun experiences. We hog hunt. We used to hog hunt. Yeah, here. Used, I did my all dad. Yeah, we raised zebras in Cameron, Texas, and would hog hunt every weekend down there. So we've had a lot of fun and met a lot of great people. And it's neat. Like Tom Buxton, he owns a hunting operation. Uh, I think it's an Erdell that I went with. Our- is that right? Arda. And uh, amazing animals. And I met Chris Clark down in Corpus Christi, another unbelievably knowledgeable, educated, longhorn guy and a massive hunter, hunts all over the world. Every time I write him, it seems like he's in another country. So <laughs> there's a lot of similarities in this cattle business and the hunting side of the world. It just, they just come, seem to come together which is neat. It is. It's very cool. And for those folks listening, that can't see your background. It's a, it's a very impressive trophy room for sure. <laughs> yeah. We have a couple animals, a couple more than probably we need, but uh, all great memories. What was the, so on the first hunt that you two went on together, what, what was it for and where was it at? I took her to West Texas for an audit. Alpine. Hunt. Yep. Alpine, Texas to his buddy's place and what you call Texas mountains, I guess. It was beautiful out yeah, there. Yeah, it's really pretty. And oh, her first animal she ever shot was at like 426 yards. Yeah, under 450 yards and was a one shot, amazing deal. And then we had to hike to the top of the mountain to go get it. <laughs> now, um, you said it was an Audad, right? Audad, yep. Yeah. Don't they smell really bad? Right? Is uh, that they get musty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, none of these animals ever really wash, so (laughs) I don't say any of them smell like flowers. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I heard that about them once, so. So what's your, what's your favorite hunt that you've done together? I know you've done so many. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I always liked tall hunting. I mean, Africa was fun. It was very memorable. Um. Because we took his parents there and Brinley with us, our daughter. Yeah, there's just a lot to see when we went there. Correct. But like we've Mm -hmm. shot 10-foot alligators in Louisiana, which was really cool. And we've done so much stuff, it's hard to pick one. Yeah. Uh, What I like to tell people is my favorite hunt's my next one. There you go. Well, when I was looking at your Instagram, I did see that you you were in Iowa recently. So how do how do the hunts here compare to some of your world travels? The, the hunts here in Texas? Iowa. No, in Iowa. Oh, yeah, where Iowa. I'm at, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That region where you live, uh, because of the the quantities of food from all the farming and agriculture, and just the weather as well creates the biggest whitetails on the planet and there isn't anybody that will disagree with me on that that illinois uh indiana iowa maybe a little bit of wisconsin because of the cold they have to get giant animals to sustain their warmth and there's so many beans and corn it's just incredible so we, we I've gone, gone there, there every, every year, year for over 20 years, sometimes multiple times a year and taken mul- uh, hundreds and hundreds of people because the animals are just so great. So 400 inch deer, uh, if, I'm not sure if you're real familiar with how you score a white tail deer, but a 400 inch deer is possible there more frequent than it is to be able to grow something like that down here in a preserve type hunt. And then in a non-preserve hunt, and for those that don't know what that means, meaning a preserve hunt is a high fence. Uh, so the one that we go to in Iowa is multiple thousand acres. It's a wonderful place. But they have 
seven or eight thousand dollars of low fence or free range or cattle fence, we're gonna call it. So basically, the animals are free to come and go as much as they also have upper 200 inch deer every year that they shoot there. So it's also like an addiction. You know, <laughs> every year you wonder if you can get a bigger one. That's pretty much the whole point behind of hunting other than food is, can there be a bigger one? So Iowa just has that. And uh, it's, it's been a part of my life for so long. It, it always will be and Lacey as well. And I'm taking Brinley for the first time this year, which I'm excited about. So we will always be in Southeast Iowa every fall until I can't do it anymore. And what do you think of our weather? What's the coldest it's, it's been while you're here? <laughs> oh, I hate your weather. Uh, again, born in Michigan, raised in Pennsylvania. I'm used to it. So the coldest it was, I went on a hunt in January in the late muzzleloader season. And it was negative 34 degree wind chill. And I was muzzleloader hunting. <laughs> And I like the fifth day a deer finally came out and I shot and missed Oh no! <laughs> so much clothes on that I couldn't get the rifle into my shoulder yeah. to see. And I made a shot in the weirdest fashion. And for some reason that deer didn't go anywhere. Maybe his eardrums were frozen. I don't know. <laughs> All the schools were closed. Which he probably just away. wanted out of his misery. If you know, once it gets that far below zero, they just give yeah, up. Sure. Like everyone, I feel like but you of any well know if the schools are closed <laughs> in Iowa due to temperature, it's cold, right? <laughs> and I, for some dumb reason, I'm hunting in this with like 20 mile hour winds. And I finally, when I did shoot the deer, my I grabbed the barrel of the gun and my hand froze to it. Oh no. And it, I got frostbite on the tips of three fingers, all just for a silly deer. I vowed to never do that again in my life. So, yeah, Iowa can be a beautiful, <laughs> can be miserable. For sure. Completely agree. No argument here. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Well, tell me a little bit about the race cars. <laughs> Lacey started, <laughs> we, we bought a drag race car because we were infatuated with the Street Outlaw show. We met one of the street outlaw guys, tried to help him, wound up not working out. He kind of took advantage of us. So we had this drag racing car that we didn't even know how to run. Uh, and we were convinced by a friend of ours, Ian Lane of, of Boostane Race Fuels, to get side-by-sides because it was much more economical. So Lacey was all about that idea. So we went and bought <laughs> her one and she found a racetrack nearby and we entered in a race and she did well. We had fun. I was like the only female in all the men. Yeah, she was one one of 20 people and she was the only woman and did well. Uh, didn't necessarily place high, but did well for her first race. And uh, I watched that race and said, man, I think I could beat everybody. So when I say we go zero to 200, we have one car. <laughs> Yeah, so she had one race then car. Then he comes home with, we end up with one, then goes to, we end up with five. Yeah. Oh, so wow. Next Tuesday, we went back to the Power Force place and bought four more because there's different classes you can run in. Yeah. And we sent them to a place to build them into race cars. And then uh, the next race came. Mm -hmm. Lacey also did, she did better, improving. I almost won my first race, but went a little too hard and flipped the race car. Oh, wow. Still laying on four wheels and almost one anyway. And then <laughs> the car decided to stop working. And then it turned into kind of insanity where we bought a big semi that could hold all the vehicles. And we traveled all over the country. And, and there became a women's division. And Lacey won two different women's championships. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and I won a couple of championships as well. And then... Uh, our daughter tried racing, but she kept running into concrete walls or yeah. flipping. And so she, he fired her. She says she retired. So there's a <laughs> debate there. Just like we talked about before, she did it because she wanted to be part of, you know, what we did, yep. but didn't really like it. So it was one, you know, no problem. You don't need to, to do this <laughs> if you certainly don't like it for crying out loud. 
Well, I feel like a lot of your stories have started with Lacey did this and Lacey wanted that. Maybe yeah, that Lacey <laughs> really gets me. I didn't realize that until you just said that. You're right. Lacey starts the. Maybe your next adventure. I take it over. There you go. Maybe your next adventure, you need to let your daughter pick and she'll, she'll find her passion then. God, I can imagine what we'll be doing. <laughs> Not a bad idea, but might be wild. <laughs> Well, what's your next Longhorn adventure going to be? This podcast will come out this summer. So what are some of the events maybe later this summer or fall that you're going to go to or pay attention to online? Well, what we're excited about is after going down to uh, Randy Murray's place, um, he has so many animals that he obviously has to, for lack of a better word, discard, you know, what he considers to be not prominent, right? Or not as good of a future as what he already has. So, you know, to put it bluntly, I I mentioned to him that the stuff that you throw away is probably better than the best stuff I have. (laughs) So in the next couple months, we plan on taking a trailer down there and loading it full of his rejects that will probably be better than anything that we have to see, you know, young Mm -hmm. yearlings or weanlings or something of that nature and see how much it will enhance our program. Still trying to stay kind of budget friendly uh, compared to some of these big, you know, big baller guys that are spending hundreds of thousands of cows. That's not anything that we intend to do anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to keep it fun and budgetively sensible in our minds. And I feel like that's a good opportunity to do that. So I'm the most excited about that more than anything. And then, just calves, all these cows that we bred this past winter, we can't wait to see what they produce in the fall. I feel like that's sometimes the hardest part is being patient and waiting for all those calves to to hit the ground and see what you get. Yeah. And if there's one thing you got from this conversation, it's that I like going full bore and there's no such thing as going full bore and having babies. You have to wait, (laughs) you know, and same thing with horns. You can't just make them get big now so we can see what they're going to be. So this is... (laughs) <clears throat> teaching me some patience that I don't necessarily have a lot of. Is it working, Lacey? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we keep buying more. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we sign off here, is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you want to share with the listeners about your program or any of your other businesses? Uh Not really about our businesses, you know, business is business. It's kind of the the part of life that you have to do to keep having fun. But on the program side, you know, if there's one thing I could recommend, if if any of these longtime breeders, uh, and I've had many talks with Mark about this, are listening to this, is in my personal opinion, if you see somebody you don't recognize you should say hi and talk about your program to them because I promise you they will be eager to listen. We, uh, the only thing that we have had negative about this whole experience is we use the legacy last year, not this past one is when we walked in there, there wasn't quite enough seating. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know anybody. And we almost kind of felt silly and we went up to a couple people that we had known their names because Lacey's not afraid to talk to anybody. It's <laughs> one of her amazing qualities. I'm usually a little bit more hesitant. Um, and we have gained some good friendships there. But there really is, out of all the things that we've done in our lives, including racing, hunting, all these different things, all our businesses, the way to get the most new users is to interact with them and make them feel welcome. Mm-hmm. And... I feel like some of these bigger names, uh, maybe, and this is an opinion, maybe feel that they're a big name and they don't need to talk to anybody, but everybody wants cows to get sold. And the best way to do that is say, hi, you know, I'm Bob and I sell cattle and you might want to look at mine. What's your name? Where are you from? Mm -hmm. I think that would really help the industry on, you know, going back and forth on being able to make the sales that they want. But the only people that we have met, to be completely honest with you, are ones that we've gone up to. 
there has not been one person that has come up and introduced themselves to us. So, and I'm not knocking people. Most everybody knows everybody because this has been a big, long standing organization. But that would be my opinion or my, if I could give a suggestion to everybody mm-hmm. is say hi to somebody that you haven't met. More, there is a chance that you could sell half your herd to them. I mean, look at Mark. Mark was the only person. Yes, we did make our first introduction, but because he stayed going to, he sold 40 head of cattle to us. Mm-hmm. And he's thankful for that because he's a smart guy. So I hope to goodness that we meet a whole lot more people um, for multiple reasons, not just to be able to, you know, learn their herd, but to build more relationships and help expand the industry. Well, and I feel like within the longhorn industry, some of those bigger breeders, like you mentioned, or the more experienced ones, they're the nicest people in the world and they are so knowledgeable and have so much to share. It's just like you said, it's that initial kind of awkwardness of having to network or, you know, introduce yourselves and stuff. But, you know, I feel like once, once that happens, it's, it is like you said, it just kind of opens the floodgates on the knowledge that you can learn and the the stories that you can hear and, and the connections that you can make. So Hopefully some of them are listening in the next sale you're at you. You get a lot of hellos and, and handshakes. <laughs> but but not just us. And don't please don't take that as me complaining about us. I'm talking about for the industry in general. Mm-hmm. Like at that at the last, let's say, legacy sale, there's so many faces mm-hmm. that we every hand or eye that looked at I said hello and introduced myself. And who knows where that could lead to. And everybody wants to talk about their cows because everybody's proud. And that's cool. Yeah. That's cool that everybody's proud. And maybe there's some you just don't want to listen to. Let's be honest. But there could be something that you can't wait to see. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's amazing. At the end of the legacy, Vincent Rapp came up to us, who's an amazingly hilarious, great guy. And he introduced us to a friend that has a cow that just blew me away on its base. Remember, we like base. Mm-hmm. And if if Vincent wasn't so boisterous and such a good guy and and if we hadn't met him we would have never met that gentleman you know what i mean so the more people introduce and uh and stick your hand out i think the bigger this industry could come and because one of the big things i'm hearing like right now the market is soft is what people keep saying well if there was a 500 more people in the room probably wouldn't be as soft right that's just a guess on my part no, yeah, I think that's I think that's great advice and great feedback for sure. But we're we're excited to meet a bunch of people and see what uh, comes up in the future, big time. Well, thank you both so much for for being on the podcast today, and we'll link your website, some of your animals, as well as all the other breeders that you mentioned uh, in the show notes, so folks can go check those out as well. Wonderful, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you, thank you.